Thank you, Rocky. Okay, we've got. We've got. I see great friends in the audience. Oliver, you made it too. And Olivia, wow. Thanks for coming. Okay, we've got. Uh, I need you as my support. Okay, so we have got. Uh, let's move through here. Get this uh, IT working. So uh, just so happy to uh, move on. Mm. Okay, uh, what I've got here is a picture of the locations of the 1,000 suppliers that I interviewed. This was over five years ago, uh, but since then I've actually supervised over 1,000 interviews just last year, 300 interviews just this January. And so my passion, I just want to share with you um, uh, before I move on to the formal part, my passion is in engaging with business people, but more importantly, uh, recently engaging with factory owners and factories in China. And what I do now is we go in with a whole team, we, do, we video end-to-end -end the whole factory, uh, the process, and then we give advice to the owner because they need help. And we need to see this whole arrangement where we've got buyers coming from the West engaging with suppliers in China and they just see, okay, the supplier is someone we outsource to. But the future is that suppliers are people that we need to partnership with, work with and help them to innovate. And that's the only future I see. And so fortunately, we have uh, you know, people in the China government also see it this way as well. What you've got in front of you is a frame. Do you all have a handout? Did I give you a handout? Yeah, because I'm going to go all over the place today and I just want you to see where I am at any point in time. Because the top four parts, okay, the top four parts, we'll come to this in a minute, the top four parts are basically what is in innovation. There's four different areas. The bottom four parts are the catalyst for innovation. And so my content today will speak to various parts of this framework. We won't cover every part. Uh, we need a day to do every part of this framework. But I just want you to know that I know where I am when it looks like that I'm going crazy. I'm getting too old to give an ordinary talk. Okay. Um, what we got, there's the 1000 study. Uh, I gave this talk um, in 2013 here. This is my latest venture. Thanks to, with KPMG, I'm writing a report with them. We get to interview all these companies here to really find out how they work with suppliers, how they help and suppliers innovate, um, more importantly. So there's the content today. Let's see how far we can go through. But most importantly, I want to hear questions from you, which is probably more uh, insightful for everyone here today. So there's our framework. Uh, very briefly, efficiency basic. Innovation is something that is probably on the front and centre uh, key strategic idea for any multinational brand name that is, that is interacting with suppliers in China. Efficiency based, we're talking about collaboration. Collaboration is needed for efficiency based innovation to occur. And there's a lot of collaboration happening. We're not going to talk too much about that today. But we know there's much more collaboration in through my interviews with the KPMG report. Um, we've already interviewed Puma, um, S. Oliver, uh, we've got H&M tomorrow, all these big brand names increasingly collaborating. All right, the government plans, the China 25 part of the title of today's talk. That's where the China 25 plan fits in the government plans. And so the One Belt, One Road, you know about that, China 25, these are the catalysts to enable this type of innovation to occur. The other type of innovation is the customer-focused innovation. All of you know of Xiaomi, right? Yes? Okay. So basically, they have not developed their presence in the market through R&D, which would happen over here. All right? They went straight to the customer and gave, gave the customer what they wanted. But they're running into trouble now in various countries, including India, where they cannot sell their phones because they do not have the licenses of the components associated with the components inside their handsets. And so R&D will take you further into the future than consumer-based innovation. Okay, so just a brief uh, review of where we are. So what I want to do now is dive into the China 25, but we're going, but 
more importantly and different, I gave this a similar talk to this in January, but we've got more information. We're going to spend a little bit more time over here about the startup community because that is very, very big, getting growing in Hong Kong as we speak. Okay, let's keep moving here. I want to, as I said, I'm, I'm not a normal in the uh, presentation here. What you've got here, can you all see that all right? We need bigger screens. All right. Guess what product is being manufactured here? Hooverboards, we all love them. The US government loves them. They banned them. All right, but these two factories are still shipping containers of hooverboards today. So where are they shipping to? The one at the bottom, when I visited, they were doing a 600 shipment to France. Okay, uh, they're shipping to uh, UAE, Russia, uh, other parts of Europe, wherever they'll take them. They're still making and shipping them. Now, here's the question for you. Which factory is the copycat? Which one is the genuine Hooverboard factory? In other words, which factory made the Hooverboards, which were the rotten apple that spoiled the whole bunch and actually caused two weeks ago the uh, Association for Batteries uh, and Transport around the world to actually ban a Nike batteries to be travelled on all couriers out of Hong Kong, out of China. So now you cannot ship anything with a lithium-ion battery in it, okay? Caused by one of these type of factories, which one? So, let's have a show of hands, let's make it interactive right from the start. Because we want to know where the bad apples come from. If we are to move into a better innovative climate in China, we need to help. We need to help these factories, and we need to help them distinguish from these factories here. So, which one? I give you. Which one's the good one? Top. Okay, top one. You got it. It looks, it looks like an assembly line. Okay. I want you to decide. Don't let me tell you. Okay. Correct. So, uh, and this company is still operating. I don't know if this one is still operating. I went here in January. That was after US had banned. They're still doing the shipments. Okay. Uh, this one here, amazing factory. They were at the trade show uh, last week. I saw all the sales people there. I don't get a commission for sales of these. I've ridden on hoverboards. Lots of fun. All right, what we're talking about. Made in China. What is this about? It's 10 key industries. It's bigger than the 555 plans that, uh, you know, that describe how the plant economy operates in China. This has taken China out to 2025, but not that. More 25 more years to 2049 to the uh, one century anniversary of the Communist Party. And that's mentioned in the 2025 plan. Okay? So it's a bold initiative. This is bold for 20, 10 industries. 10 industries which you would say, okay, they're the higher margin ones. It's a no brainer. Why don't they choose them? Yes, they did choose them. So what's new? Okay? But it's really interesting when you go into the details of these 10 industries because some of them talk about global domination. It's not just China, okay? So which ones are they? And you've probably got some of them here. Uh, and I'll go through some of them now. There, there's our 10 industries here that uh, have been targeted. Sorry, textiles is not in there, but there is a place for textiles in the future in China. Uh, all right. There's the mission. We know the PMI is, you know, under 50, you know, and a lot of media is focusing on that. The media is fo uh, focusing on other things too. The media is focusing on the fact that FDI outflows just eclipse inflows for the first time in history, and that was in last year, 2015. But inflows are still pretty high, okay? Uh, and the, here's, here's my take on the uh, China 2025 plan. Here are the 10 industries. And what I've got here is shipbuilding, aviation, shipbuilding, aviation, railways, uh, new energy vehicles. Notice the bars represent the size of that industry. And this is in trillion, one trillion, two trillion, three trillion, four trillion, five trillion, five, six trillion, and you're talking about in yuan. So very, very large amounts. The IT industry is going to represent the largest by 2025, the green bar. Okay. Railways, you'd understand, uh, they're exporting out of China. The red percentages represent the goal for the percentage of exports of those industries by 2025. So, for example, shipbuilding, they want 50% exports by 2025. Okay, uh, Railways, 40% export by 2025. 
I want to dig into one of these, and that is new energy vehicles, because we're all going to be affected by some what by this some way or another in the future, new energy vehicles. And so you probably think, wow, such a little thing, how can it have large, large impact? Here's the number that you need to pay attention to. Let's have a look, where's our number? 80%. What does that 80% mean? By 2025, the 2025 plan is saying that by uh, that date, um, over 80% of the new energy vehicles made and sold in the world will come from China. Like, this is a world plan, it's not just a China plan. This is not just a China bounce back plan, this is a world. And I think this is something that we should be excited about uh, in any one of these industries to t tag along. Uh, and you're probably thinking, well, you know, where's fashion, textiles and all that? Here's, here's, let me be blunt here, okay? All right? There's another industry that's being targeted, part of the textiles and fashion industry, that's always going to be big in China, because it's already a huge base, okay? But there's another plan I'm not talking about today. I'll just mention it on the side. You can do your research on it. And that is the Water 10 plan. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. All right. You don't, want to be so, you don't necessarily want to be associated with that if you don't know about it very well. All right. The Water 10 plan are specific KPIs for the government uh, targeted various industries that are near any one of those seven rivers in China to actually scale back, either change the technology or move out and that's, that's a plan. So, uh, for investors, do you want to invest in that area or you want to invest in any of the 2025, okay? That's my bottom line takeaway for you today, all right? Even though I'm not talking about the Water 10 plan. Okay? I'm not a macro investor myself, but here's another thing if you're in, in that side of investment. Asia infrastructure demand, we're talking about 730 billion. Wow, that is huge, okay? Uh, and the goal uh, of the A AIIB is to raise 100 billion, Asia Development Bank 10 billion. And so let's go back to some of these industries um, that could contribute to that need of infrastructure in Asia, railways. Okay? And this is what uh, China's targeting, 40% export. The point I want you to take away is the 2025 plan is more than just, okay, this is just a China thing. This is how China can actually feed the world in specific targeted areas. So uh, new energy vehicles, one last part of this, because I'm excited about this. Actually, if, if China consumed the same amount of oil through its cars as America did, it would actually use more oil uh, today than the total world oil production. Okay? So there is a need for new energy vehicles. So wh what's that landscape look like? Uh, guess what? BYD is here. It is the today. It is the largest. It is the larger, largest manufacturer of new energy vehicles in the world. Okay. And you're probably thinking, oh, Neil. Okay, enough about this. Where's this? Get, you love the factory stuff. Uh, how does that uh, reconcile? BYD, less than 15 years ago, went <coughs> to be the approved supplier of Motorola. Okay, because it was making little batteries that go into those mm. little phones. Mm. They were, they were big back then, but little batteries, right? And so Motorola rejected them twice. They accepted them on the third time, okay, as an OEM, all right? And they never looked back from there. BYD's innovation started with, number one, the owner's mindset, plus the help of Motorola. And I think this is, uh, when we talk about Catalyst, being an OEM supplier, being a supplier that works with the brand names, that know a lot is a major, major road for the future of China suppliers. So this is, a, I think that the BYD is a great example to show how the future of China suppliers can operate. Let's keep moving here. You know uh, this Under Armour, they've got into the shoe business now. They are everything else business now they're in shoes because the owner of Under Armour discovered there was this special technology in Guangdong where, uh, have you heard of uh, Regina Miracle, is that right? Yes. yes. And so Regina Miracle uh, made them bras and they had their special glue. Okay. And so the owner of Under Armour said, hmm, maybe we can do that to shoes. And so now they're collaborating. And that's where the fly knit shoe uh, comes from.
for the Under Armour shoe. Now, have no sewing on them at all. Uh, the top part is totally printed or to printed or knitted by machine, and then it's just glued to the sole. And so, where's that technology? Not in Vietnam. We have Vietnam to make a lot of shoes, Cambodia made a lot of shoes. It's in China. Okay? So there's hope for China in even those sunset industries with the technology advancements that occur. And so lots of, uh, lots of exciting ideas that are coming up when we actually look at these practices one by one and we're looking at what they're doing. Okay, back to our framework. I've just uh, covered a bit of China 25, China uh, 2025. Okay, what I want to do is move on to part of the mindset of the supplier which is definitely needed for developing R&D uh, innovation. Okay, the challenges of innovation in the supplier. Look, last week I was at the trade show, the Global Sources trade show, that was, now it's a, the two weeks combined, it's, it's the biggest in the world, bigger than CES <coughs> in USA. And amazing show, like the one here in Wan Chai is amazing, but like put together, Hong Kong is the center. And really proud to be like uh, be part of that. I, 18 years in Hong Kong. One-stop service. Look at this. This is one of the supplies we sort of trade check. One-stop service. R&D, designer, mold maker, machine production. Wow, they do everything for you. I was talking to a bunch of startups uh, last week at Global Sources, and I was telling them about this. Wow, you don't have to worry now. Your worries are all gone. They can do this for you. But the big challenges that they have is protecting their IP, uh, making sure they get the quality, making sure that they can get 90% of the margin, just get 10% to the supplier. You know, this is their mindset, a lot of these startups, right? Yeah, uh, but uh, this will work if the startup works with this supplier in a very proactive, collaborative sense. But for those startups think that they just pass everything onto a supplier like this, uh, they're sure to be Ah, disappointed, okay, either through IP challenges or either through quality challenges, missed delivery times and things like that. Collaboration is very, very important when we get to that. More about that in a minute. But here's the situation with the startup communities in Hong Kong, actually in the USA, trying to work with China, okay. Customer discovery and development, we're moving over to startups now, customer discovery and development has been well documented. Everyone knows you get a bunch of people in the audience, I can actually test products on you right today, okay? It's very easy to do. That's easy, all right? But R&D manufacturing on either side of the chasm. So we've got startups coming out of Silicon Valley. We've got several incubators in Hong Kong, from Cyberport out to the Science Technology Park. Now we've got the $800 million Mills project out near Ching Wan. You know all about that? Okay, so the hubs everywhere, the incubators, wonderful, again, lots of ideas. The challenge is, how do you get those ideas into a factory that you can trust to get that product out on time, quality, IP protected? That's the big challenge, because there are literally, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars at the door of venture capital, just waiting to flow in if we can solve that chasm. Getting between startups, and the manufacturers across the border. Okay. Uh, Pebble, they raised $10 million in 2012. They nearly went broke trying to, trying to make watches in Shenzhen. Fortunately, now they've done another round. They're about to ship their newest watch in May this year. That's next month. Well, wow, that's in a couple of days' time. Right? They just raised another $20 million from its for its latest start, uh, smartwatch. So they survived, but a lot of startups do not survive. HTC, do you all know the one when that came out in 2013? It had a fancy camera on it. It was a better <coughs> camera, but it said 4.5 megapixels or something. And everyone was using 12 or 13 megapixels and thinking, oh, I'd never buy a camera with that many megapixels. It was a different technology. It was a low, low light technology, amazing technology. Like HTC are really ahead of uh, the game in terms of new technology. They found this diamond in the rough, this supplier in China that had this technology, but the problem was that supplier could not make the millions that HTC needed. And I was, remember I was in, with, in HTC in February 2013, talking to the operations manager. He had to cancel his trip to a show in Germany and actually supervise 700 of their own team to go to that supplier to actually ramp up the production. Okay? Often, suppliers are really good at design, or they're very good at process. It's very hard to find one that can do both. 
okay? And uh, those that find that have got that diamond in the rough. And what else is happening? Uh, the show, uh, PCB board manufacturers, I love them. I always love asking, oh, how many layers have we got this time? Is it up, up to 40 layers, 70 layers, whatever? Uh, all right, but now I go to these manufacturers and look, this here, uh, this is a food tester. You stick it into your vegetable or your fruit and it will tell you how much uh, poisons are inside, uh, certain chemicals, immediately. So you're in the supermarket and you test before you buy, right? All right. Uh, this one here, blood, pre blood pressure monitor. I can't believe it. In a like They're not making it for another company. This is their own design. This is their own brand they're developing. They're going vertical. PCB board manufacturers are going vertical for the first time. This is new information to me. I've never read about uh, this new strategy. And this partly describes the strategy of other suppliers because I've been fortunate to speak to over 1,500 suppliers on over three occasions for global sources <coughs> in the last uh, November, December, uh, and in Dong One in March this year. And the questions they ask, how do we go B2B? How do we go B2C? How do we actually bring... We don't want to sell to buyers. We want to go direct to market ourselves. How do we develop <coughs> our brand? This is the mindset of suppliers at the moment across the border. Amazing, amazing things going on. Let's, uh, all right. So, uh, you know, I don't want to bore you with too evidence from show interviews, April 2015. That's a bit out of date. No, I'm better than that. Um, <laughs> January 2016, that's better. All right, so 300. Uh, what is your number one challenge? Competition, cost control, poor economy. Well, how are you responding to that? And so then we ask lots of questions, how they're responding to that. Happy to uh, share this with you after the, uh, after the talk. But we're trying to understand what's in the mind of the supplier. There's only a small percentage, let me, let me give the graphs to you in, in one line. There's only a small percentage of suppliers that are responding in terms of R&D, trying to improve their products, trying to improve the efficiency of their operations. We're talking about less than 20% of all the suppliers that we interview, okay? So there's a great, there's a huge gap for improvement uh, across the border, okay. Those are like toys, uh, same again, we get the same responses, competition, cost control, poor economy, okay? And again, for baby products, okay? Again, all challenge, they're all challenge, we, no, nothing new here. But, here's the groovy start. Factory management, I, went, I, went, I visited these companies in the last, uh, was it November, December, January this year? Actually, last Friday, we went and visited two more factories. I haven't got time to put these ones up, but enough of here for your, your senses today. And what I'm going to do is show you some videos we took at these factories, just to point out how we're trying to help the factories. But we want to make buyers more open to collaboration. There are so much opportunities to help and it just helps directly in negotiations, even if you just want to have an arm's length deal. If you can give them ideas for how they can improve. I remember that my first visit was, oh, let's go to Boan District. Uh, and this company here was uh, making smartwatches. Then the same day, in the afternoon, we went to this company here making USBs. I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> okay, next time we do the factory visit, we've got to do two or three in the day. I want them only two or three kilometers apart, not, <laughs> not here and here, too much traveling. Okay, these are things I'm learning. Okay, all right, speed. Here, let me get back to these two hoverboard factories because this is very important. Um, and this is, the, this is the challenge that, uh, that beset the hoverboard business around the world and you know, caused uh, different airlines, all airlines to ban these. Uh, the challenge, see this battery here? This is how it's arrived in this factory here. It's in a blue pack, and it's got a stamp on it that says from Samsung. I don't know it's from Samsung, mm -hmm. all right? And, but that's what they've got. They're not testing it. This factory here is testing every factory from, sorry, testing every battery that comes from Samsung. There's a machine there. It just, did I use, there it is. Every battery is being tested individually, all right? So when you go to the factory, you see the difference, big difference between this factory and this one here. And I think this is what the world doesn't see. This is what buyers overseas don't see. And they think, oh, we can manage this from an arm's length. But I think that's no longer the case because 
This can get all of us into trouble when we've got these two just shipping products and then they ban things that go on airlines and then it affects everyone in this room. Okay, no matter your hoverboards, even a good product, and you've got the best batteries in the world, the airline won't ship. Okay, so uh, we've got to be aware of that. Uh, and so let's go to another one. All right, here's another, here's another smartwatch manufacturer. This is the first one I went to. Here's the second one, two smartwatch manufacturers. Uh, and so we're going into the receiving inspection area. And this is, I think, the biggest challenge that a lot of suppliers are having at the moment, receiving inspection. Uh, area. Oliver, you know about this uh, very, very well. But receiving materials inspect inspection, as one owner said to me, I've got a Bluetooth speaker, four US dollar, FOB, I don't have the resources to spend on receiving inspection. Okay, and so that's the thinking about receiving inspection. But most of the factories I, visit, I have visited are very weak on receiving inspection. This is one area where we buyers can spend more time with. This one here does not have an EOM relationship, they're just making their, o, sorry, OEM. Uh, they're just making their own brand. This one had a previously an OEM relationship with Sharp. So they made set top boxes for Sharp and now they made smart watches. You can see the difference between the two. This one has a much better documented, see so documentation of every process, of every process in the assembly line. Uh, very little documentation here. Uh, no electrostatic bands. This is a, there's one there, but some of them are remote, which are not as strong as the one that are wired connected. But not, not all the solderers had electrostatic bands. Uh, these did, although that these were remote anyway. Okay, so interesting there. Guess what? This factory here is gone. This factory is no longer exists. Gone! It's in video only now. You will not see this. This one still exists. So how can you tell beforehand or to help them? Well, you can see, number one, that OEM background. They've got everything documented. They're very systematic. They really are serious about making the best smartwatches that they can make. Okay, this one here, uh, well, you've got factories uh, starting up overnight. And then they say, we've got a brand. This smartwatch industry, we can make lots of money here. Let's just start making smartwatches. Okay. Now, this factory here uh, no longer exists, but the company still does. You can still go to the website, Alibaba Global Sources, and you can still buy the watches from this company. What they're doing is they just stop the lease of the premises, and now they just outsource, and they get another factory. And that's another beauty, and many of you are aware of, that when faced with turmoil and tumultuous times like now where factories are closing down, one approach is, okay, let's close down the physical factory and let's just outsource and get someone else to make our product for us. Okay? And, and that's fine when I talk to buyers, do that, but buyers, just be aware and bring that into your negotiation, bring that into your audit, quality checking processes. Okay, let's get attention to detail. Right, here's a... And, it's so many surprises when you come out here. Just throw something at me if I go for too long on this. Lady comes out of an administrative office, bless her heart, uh, but she's got these watches. And we stop and say, what's going on here? Uh, all the watches just lined up. They told us that, oh, we're just testing the Bluetooth. We can't test on the assembly line because it will interfere with other radio frequency tests that they've got going on. And uh, so that's great, but they've taken it out of the dust-free zone into the office space. And now they're not even covered here. They're all lined up. Would you like to buy one of those watches? It could be scratched. Anything can happen. So they just don't have that sense of protecting every little watch that they want to sell. This one here, full QC form here, uh, and much tighter uh, rules on their quality control and everything like that. So attention to detail is a big thing that we're trying to teach these factories. Uh, I always meet the owners. They get a copy of the video just to even show them in even more detail, vivid detail. This is, I want to show you what I see and I give that to the owners of the factories. They all get a copy of the video. I don't put this on YouTube for my glorification. I just want to try another way to make the world aware of how we can help make factories better across the border. Uh, Aoni, and I actually, uh, I asked them, can I talk about your company? They said yes, and I want to talk about their company because 
this is a very good company and may, with what I've seen. It's, I'll just talk as we the video, you see for yourself. But even uh, people at the startup show, I told them, I told the startups, you want to know about prototyping, you go visit this company. Even if you're not going to contract with them, you ring them up and you visit them. Or it's your death nail in terms of your own product development. Because you get across the border and visit the good ones. So then you have some sense of what's out there and not just do everything at arm's length. This was my message to the startups last week. Uh, everything, they were making the uh, car videos uh, that you put in your dashboard. I should have one on my head for, because I don't have a car in Hong Kong, but I w I'd like to have a video for where I walk in Hong Kong, right? Okay, so uh, everything, you know, you've got the dust protection for a certain task here. There, everything is separated. Everything, this is where I think a lot of uh, factories can learn from and also buyers can learn from to see, okay, what is a minimum requirement? Uh, for the NGOs that check on their HR, we've got uh, suction machines for those doing the soldering. So this is all, they all pass the test on all those areas. This Ioni is an amazing company, five floors. So you've got injection molding machines, then you've got assembly, then you've got SMT machines. Uh, then they've got a design house, then they've got a showroom, everything all in one, boom. So you go there and actually develop a prototype with them, then get them to make it for you, all in one big package. Amazing, amazing, amazing. But on this day, we're going through here, and we get to the end, and I'm thinking, wow, this company is so, you know, I'd like to, I always find mistakes and problems where I can help these factories. And I, I think, wow, what's wrong with, nothing wrong here. What can I tell them? <laughs> I'm wasting the owner's time, the factory manager's time. Well, we got to the end and they had a 10% rejection rate on this, this one you see here, 10% rejection rate. 10%. We were talking about wages going up in China, you know, $3, $4 US an hour. That's nothing, okay? 10% rejection rate, this is where factories can help uh, improve areas so they can survive. 10%, wow, that means they're thrown away, every 10 of these, for every 100 they make. And here it is here, you don't believe me? I want to show you. So, there's all the rejections, uh, from 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, uh, in one day, 274, and then about 10%, you can count them up for yourself, okay? So, this is where uh, the factories need help. One more thing, all right? And then they said to me, well, we've just had a new, back We've just started this line, that's why the rejection rate is there. Hopefully with learning, the rejections will go down. So we got in discussion. Okay, so tell me about your staff uh, turnover. And they said, oh, it's normal for Sunjin. So what's normal for Sunjin? Can we have a percentage? What, 20%? 30%? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 50% for this company. Like, Everything else about this company is perfect. They've got the heating room uh, you know, where they're testing everything, 24 hours, everything. Everything's perfect. But they've got a turn staff turnover of 50%. Wow, and I'm thinking, wow, you need to do something about that, okay? Because that's going to be unsustainable in terms of you want to reduce costs in the future over time. That is your unsustainable point. And you need to try and deal with that. Do you have job rotation? No. Okay, do you have a bonus? Uh, yes, we do. We give a bonus every month to the staff based on company performance. And I'm thinking, ah, why don't you actually give an extra bonus uh, for every week? An extra one. Don't put too much pressure on the workers. So we're going to give you more if we can get this rejection rate down to 3%, 4% from 10%. Then we're going to give it back to the workers. Okay? So... Uh, and the purpose of that bonus, this is something that they're trying out at the moment, the purpose of that bonus is to create an awareness among the workers, not to give them extra pressure, but to create an awareness, okay? There's always different purposes of uh, bonuses. And the other thing I was talking to them about is try to think about how they could pr uh, give job rotation. Like, I wouldn't mind working in an injection moulding machine shop for more than three months. Well, enough of that. Okay, I'd, I'd like to know I'm coming back after Chinese New Year to another area in the firm. Okay. But this, I think this is a huge challenge, job turnover uh, among these factories in St. John. Let's keep moving here. 
All right, enough of that. All right, enablers, case studies of recent startups and prototypes. Uh, if you go back to your, your framework, you've got your framework here. All right, well, I'm going to finish up with this because I'm really excited about it. And this speaks to a lot of startups that are in Hong Kong. So if you go to the bottom part, we're talking about private investors' startups. Okay? So it, part of what I talk about then is more about the owner mindset change. But not only that, in, in trying to in educate buyers or people that actually collaborate with these factories. All right? it's, there's so much stuff done at arm's length, which doesn't help either party. Uh, but we're not looking at, okay, where, uh, in the future, there are catalysts for innovation. A lot of it's coming from startups. But what I said earlier, the big challenge for these startups is they, they want to develop their prototype. Where do they go for the prototype where they can protect their interests? All right, that's the challenge. And so let's have a look at some that have been making it. And I actually put into another, I love frameworks, I put into another framework. If you want to do everything at arm's length in China, well then you can get sourcing agency distributors to work on this part. You can get lawyers to work on this part and auditors to work on this part. And you don't even have to visit the region. And a lot of these Amazon power sellers do that anyway. But, you know, that's a fad. We don't know how long that's going to last. The ones that will last in a sustainable way, that is, want to develop their own margin, develop their own brand, develop their and you know, customised product, will have to get involved in one, two and three to a greater extent. So, are there startups that are doing that? There, some of the companies I've been talking to, some, there's about five or six startups in this group. Can you, can you spot the startups? Anyone from PolyU here? It might be my next university. I've been to City U, Hong Kong U, and now Baptist U. Let's try Poly U. Okay, Poly U came up by dummy. Okay, all right. Uh, Brink and Tech Packer, they are enablers. I briefly mentioned that. Uh, Flowship, Grom, uh, 3D printing. Okay, so uh, Gochi. We're going to mention some of them right now. Let's get into it very, very quickly. Two enablers, four startups in four minutes. Gochi Tech, they just raised $30,000 on Kickstarter. How did they do the prototype? How did they actually work with their factory? Well, fortunately, the owner, originally his ancestors are from Dongguan, and he actually has a factory in Dongguan. Matthew, his name is. Lovely guy. And so the factory, he owns Charming Pop. Do you know Charming Pop? It's a brand. He's got two shops in Chin Tao Choi uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, they make... Uh, Leather goods, handbags, fashion accessories. Ladies, go and check out Charming Pop for Matthew. Okay, anyway, so he, now he's got Gochi Check where he's combining a man bag type thing with a, with a battery in the spine. And so then you can put your phone in it and it will charge it wirelessly. Okay, so he raised $30,000 in the Gilgo. So he couldn't do that in his factory. He'd do the leather side, but he didn't do the battery. He outsourced that part. And so he's able to actually bring the electrical part, the battery, the circuits, into his factory and they're assembling his factory like a black box. So then the suppliers don't know, they couldn't copy the final product, things like that. Great, great idea. So, first solution, own the factory, own one factory in China. That solves one problem. Okay, what about Grom? Here's another solution. Grom make the orthopedic insoles. So they deal, they deal a lot with podiatrists all around the world. So you go there when you've got foot problems, right? Yes? Okay. And so everyone's feet is different, yes? So your IP is solved. IP problem is solved. Because that custom design for 3D printing only fits one pair of feet in the world. Are you with me? So the factory copies it. They do whatever they like with it. It's not going to fit anyone else. So, number two, you make a perfectly customised product that only suits one person in the world. That is another solution, and that's what Grom is doing now. So, they're working, they're doing 3D printing in China. Their big challenge, now 3D printing, you think, okay, that's a solution for, you know, the factory malaise in China. 3D printing is different. 3D printing is about 100% perfection, no defects, but you still need a lot of labour to do post printing uh, processing, yeah, cleaning, what's, uh, cleaning what comes out of the 3D printer. Okay, one more. 
I dummy. We want. I think it's important we show I dummy. It's wonderful. This is out of Hong Kong. It's amazing. Out of uh, Poly U, but they found a major backer, a major partner, and it was Winsim. That's a factory in Dongguan, I think. And they came and invested with iDummy and working with iDummy to actually take it from prototype to full production. Okay, so number three, find a major backer who already has a factory in China, and that's what iDummy is currently doing at the moment. That's an electrically adjusted mannequin that all uh, fashion houses would love to have. And you just type in the measurements in a computer and then the mannequin just changes. All right. Uh, Ambi Climate. Another, here is another, this is probably more of the typical startup approach. But and, you know Julian Lee, Ambi Climate, they've raised lots of money from Kickstarter, $100,000. What did they do? They they did their own design in-house in Hong Kong. They did 100 units. What were they making? They were making a little uh, thing that looks like this. It's in plastic. You put it in your mantelpiece, and then on your iPhone you can find out what's the humidity, temperature, but more than that, what is the pollution and all different types of readings. So lots of circuitry inside the design. So you can think one supplier can make the circuitry, one supplier can make the housing on the outside. So they first did prototyping in Hong Kong, 100 units by hand. Then 500 units with a factory in Sunjun, but only they did a soft tooling. In other words, they got tooling made that could only be that could only be used for 5,000 units at the most. So protect the IP by using soft tooling, and also it allowed Ambi Climate to pivot. In other words, if they want to change a little part of that shell on the outside, they could before they go to a major hard tooling prototype. And then they moved, to, they're, in a, they're in a stage now moving to a bigger factory and now they've got a manufacturing consultant in to help advise on that. So there you have uh, four case studies on how they are trying to get over this chasm between lots of ideas, lots of money, and you've got factories on the other side. We need to solve that. If we can solve that, bang, you know, it makes all of us even stronger in this area, in this region. The enablers, Tech Packer. Tech Packer can help. Because when I asked Julian Lee, what is your number one challenge? Uh, communication and managing the process. Well, Tech Packer gets to the heart of communications. How many of you have heard of Tech Packer? All right, so they're a startup, they're out at the Cyberport at the moment. Okay, and they, it's uh, software as a service. You subscribe to the software. And that software has its own communications. So, special cuff, all right, special collar. Right, special tie, what, every little part of a suit is broken down into little pieces. And so then you can say to the pattern maker in another organisation, in a factory, oh, we want to put piece number 102 with this. Can you put that together for us? And so again, you're not talking in Chinese, you're talk, not talking in English, you're talking in terms of standardised parts of any garment in the world. And they, they've got over 4,000 different standardised parts that go together, more than that. It's open source. Uh, fashion houses around the world contribute to Tech Packer uh, software database. Okay, so and that's an enabler. Okay, so Tech Packer, and that's out of Hong Kong. So I think this is wonderful. This is exciting. Another enabler is Brink, and Brink is in Hong Kong at the moment. Uh, these uh, they got one, two, three, four, five. They got about ten or a dozen startups working with them. What is their business model? You go to Brink, and they'll take you from end to end. They'll work with your initial designs, prototype, uh, mass manufacturing, and then marketing right at the end. But uh, give us a percentage of your equity. Okay? And you probably think, that sounds like a venture capital. Hmm. No. They have the knowledge. They have the know-how. The people at Brink have a lot of experience with mass manufacturing and bringing stuff to the market on time. And so they only choose startups that are going to have a sustainable model, that there's, the startup is going to be around beyond the first idea. That's very important. There's so many startups that are going to be one hit wonders. They don't want any of them. All those startups there are looking at their second and third idea at the moment uh, in this incubator. So that's Brink. Brink is an enabler. Tech Packer is an enabler. And then I've just showed you four examples of startups, how they are trying to get this chasm. And so, uh, we don't have time for the mega trend. You can take a photo of that if you like. But these are the big challenges.
for supplies. Happy to send this list to you. So uh, either way, you can take that. Size, human resources, quality mindset, world-class relationships, e-commerce, lots of stuff there. If any of you want to ask a question on that, you can. There's eight challenges for buyers. I'll take a photo of that. But that's what I'll leave with you tonight, uh, this afternoon, because we don't have questions. This framework here, what I've taken you through initially was the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is actually the drive, engineering-based innovation. Okay, collaboration, a lot of that is already happening with the major brand names. So increasingly realising that they have to work closely with suppliers. I guess Oliver is sending their designers from Germany into Hong Kong to work with the factories. Uh, okay, G GA are bringing their designers from Italy into Hong Kong, sending them to the factories. No more over email. It's face-to-face, -face, same room stuff. That's increasingly happening now. That's collaboration. That and helps efficiency-based innovation also. Uh, that's what I've been trying to do with my visits to the factories, help the owners get more aware of this. Uh, owner mindset has to change for more R&D innovation to occur. We're talking about uh, BYD, but I spent more, uh, e probably equal time as the 2025, on talking about how startups can get involved in terms of collaborating with factories in China. With that, uh, thank you for your attention. I want to have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very wonderful and exciting presentation and with unique perspectives gained from the on-the-ground experience. Well, you talk a lot about um, uh, the, the, the trends and I, I have a question about how we can, uh, how manufacturers can, in general, get ahead of the curve uh, going forward? It's a very general question for manufacturers. Okay, right now they're, they're going, if we talk about a base mentality, A, B, C, D, a lot of factories are going, they're trying to do A, C, D. They're not going past B. They're not doing, the, getting the processes right, the operational processes, uh, and all the quality control steps in place. They're trying to get to that final product as soon as possible. So they're very fast at learning, but they are skipping steps that have traditionally been required for a sustainable quality and on-time uh, mentality in actually delivering products to market. I think that's where I see, that's where I see them at the moment. That's a question. Um, about the uh, sourcing in China, how do you uh, protect uh, IP, um, and feasibility, of course, you have lawyers and everything, how, how it works in actual cases, I mean, how are you going to protect it? Okay, very good question, because there was a professor out at the trade show last week, it wasn't me, saying that, oh, with startups, we're just going to get product to market as soon as possible, don't worry about IP. And maybe he said, okay, that's with respect to software, but you have to be concerned about IP from day one. So how do you do it? Uh, definitely need with a, a triple N agreement or a non-disclosure agreement. That always has to be on the table. Okay. Number two, for startups, you can never expect to protect yourself in court because you probably won't have the money all the time to fight something. And yes, you can take supplies to court in China and win. Yes, you can. Okay. But it's whether you have the time or the resources to do that. And it's going to be too late, you lost all that opportunity that you spent so much time de developing, which is going to be your greater cost. Okay? So, yes, so number one, yes, you still have to have the documentation. But number two, there are physical ways of protecting. In the four ideas I gave you, a lot of them took a physical approach. Okay? So they either owned a factory and then they, they brought different components into the factory they owned. Okay? Another Another one is you have a, you actually employ a black box factory. Like Passage Maker, for, uh, my partner Mike Bellamy has a black box just across the border. And what happens is uh, you want a special product. Equipment here, you've got something here and something here. You don't want the supplier of this part to see this part of the total product. You get the suppliers to deliver them to the black box factory. And then the black box factory assembles together. Okay. Now another part of IP protection also is in the packaging. So even if a supplier knows the final product, you want to protect them from the packaging. So you get that product delivered to a black box factory and that you employ that factory just to put the packaging on. 
Okay? And there's another example of another supplier. My friend is actually, 2 o'clock every day, he's actually picking up, the, going to the supplier and picking up products in boxes that are blank. There's nothing on the boxes. Blank. And they're bringing them to his factory. And so he presses the button on the computer and the, the label maker comes out and they just label the boxes. Then they're sent to FedEx and then shipped out. Okay, so physically, combined with the legal is going to work. But if you just do one or the other, uh, you have to hope. And you don't want to hope. Yes. Um, I, just on that, uh, I'd encourage everyone, read the China Law Block. I'm not a lawyer, but read the China Law Block. It is amazing knowledge about, they talk about the challenges that current clients are having. The mistakes they make, like not having an NDA, uh, not uh, putting details in. Or when, it, when they do an NDA, they only get the owner of the factory to do the NDA, but not the engineer. And the engineer then goes and shares the information. Or they think about the NDA and thinking, okay, it's a factory, but the Chinese approach on the NDA thinking, oh, you mean my extended family is okay to share with? And the extended family of the factory is all the subsidiary factories around it. Okay? So these things you need to make very, very clear in the NDA. Hi, I'm just wondering, in your opinion, what are the most exciting opportunities that manufacturing 2025 for China presents for Hong Kong? The most exciting presents. I think new. Okay, with the Pearl River Delta, I would think more of the, the IT. The IT is very, very big for China. If you looked at the, the graph I showed you, that you know, trillions of dollars, it, it mammoths any of the other sections. Uh, and so the IT services, very, very, very big. Okay. And if you ask me on the hardware side, it would be the Internet of Things. In the 2025 plan, the closest thing to that would be new energy vehicles. And because you have motor vehicles, then there's so much opportunities for integration of electronics or Internet of Things into those vehicles. Yeah, very good question. Mm. Any other question? There's yes. a question. Uh, you, I, you mentioned the uh, helping those factories with improving their systems and their flows and and uh, we're a trading company with fairly small buying power, I, I think, in most factories that we work with, maybe 5%, pushing them to really improve on, on their own quality systems. Not so amazing. I think in our case, we just select a different factory if it, if it sucks, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ideally, you want... Do they know that you will actually select another one if they don't change? That's what, number one, okay? So it's about being transparent with them, okay? That they are competing. If you want to compete better, then here are the dimensions you need to hit all the time. I'll give you an example. When I go into the factory, uh, uh, speaking of 400 suppliers in Dong One, and I'm showing some of these videos, I'm trying to teach the suppliers you should do this, this, this. I stopped one of the videos at uh, uh, going to Aoni and I'm putting the blue sock on, you know, the blue sock on my. And so the video just stopped, right? It's got me putting this blue thing on. So I show, you know, and across the room, everyone started writing, all right? And I'm thinking, the day after, I'm pretty sure that all the blue socks in Dong Guan were sold out. They're thinking, okay, we're going to buy blue socks because when the buyer next visits us, we're going to make the buyer wear those blue socks. But only for that purpose, all right? It's not going to be a systematic... Uh, rule for everyone in the factory and so look, you've got to start somewhere right and as the framework I showed you here it starts with the mentality uh, it starts with it's, it's a mindset change and that takes time so for me I have time to go to the factory I'm a professor at university I really appreciate uh, they support me in many ways to go across any time visit the factories so not every businessman, time is money, you have time to just go and teach all the time. 
but I'm making sure I optimize my time by number one, I video. So then hopefully you show the video to the owners and then they hopefully can get a much deeper sense of how important this is, okay? Because they want it, also they want to see how other factories are doing it also. So when I speak to global sources, I will show some of these videos and the suppliers just, wow, you know, they stop looking at their smartphones and then, and I'm just speaking in English, but it could be the most boring talk ever if I didn't have videos to show. English with Chinese translation, how slow, you understand. I've got four or five hundred suppliers watching. Uh, so it takes time. Global Source is doing a big thing in actually, they have 18 to 24 conferences throughout China every year. And I've only been, I've only presented four of them in Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Dongguan, Shanghai. And every time, four to five hundred suppliers turn up. So that's another way we can help try and get this mind change. It takes time. It, it's a generational thing because part of the problem in here is that owner mindset changed. They've got to change from family to data driven. They've got to change from patriarchal approach to how we run this business to a data driven approach. And that takes time. That's a generational mindset change in some cases. Most owners don't get that. Yeah. I hope I answered part of your question. Yeah, I, I may start taking videos as well and <laughs> show them to the other factories how to how to do things Maybe. right or wrong. Yes, yes. And, uh, and demonstrate. Maybe that's that's the game. Possibly. With time running out, uh, we're well. Sorry, one last question, question, if possible. Okay, sure. Uh, any advice on how to find a good quality, low how to buy a good quality, low volume supplier from China? <laughs> Good quality, low volume. Yes, uh, go to AliExpress, I, but I can't guarantee you'll get uh, good quality. Okay, but now I've been to 15 factories I've videoed now, and the whole range of electronics. So you can say to me, Neil, um, I would actually go to one of those factories first, one of those 15 that I've been to. Even the Bluetooth factory, they could give you a 500 mm order quality, but receiving materials is not very good. But they're going to give you the ones that work at the end. They're paying the price of having bad receiving materials inspection. But I, what I would do if I was sourcing from that Bluetooth speaker factory, I would tell the third party auditor, uh, I want you to audit 50% of the stock at the end. I'll pay you double or triple to do that. And so don't worry about whether they do the quality or not. You just throw money on the auditing at the end. Make sure you just don't audit 5%. Mm -hmm. You audit a, a larger batch of that small order. Okay? And um, I really appreciate this opportunity to have Neil with us. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Thank you guys. I'll pass my card around as we go around, okay? So don't don't get grab me grab that card. <laughs>